Thank you very much for joining us today at uh, an FCI presentation. My name is Ian Fox from FW Properties. I'm also the Vice Chair of NFCI. Um, it's great to see so many people turn out today and thank you for your time at lunchtime. We are going to keep fairly strictly to, uh, to um, a time scale. We'll be away from, from here roughly about one o'clock, I hope. Um, so I'm really excited about uh, coming, coming, yeah. Just filter in, don't worry. We are we're going to have a few people coming in. So, um, great, really excited about today's presentation. It's sort of slightly been held under wraps for some time. I think it's about to start coming out in public consultation. Um, an area of East Norwich uh, regeneration, which uh, is a hugely ambitious project, which is um, of large swathes of land that have probably been uh, sort of uh, semi-redundant and uh, for many years, but it's got some jewels in the crown, which uh, we're going to hear all about today. Um, the presentation has kindly been uh, filmed by David Hedge of Canham Consulting, so we can put it onto YouTube uh, afterwards if anybody would like to view it back afterwards. So I'll welcome uh, our present presenter today, Graham Nelson. I'm sure you all know him very well. Um, he's not great on social media, so I did struggle to find a lot of information about him. Uh, um, he joined. He came to Norwich in 2008, so he's been here about 15 years. He came as head of planning. Uh, and he's, he's, a, he's from Middlesbrough, he's a Teesside boy. Um, he's been in East Anglia for all his working life, pretty much. So he's worked in Suffolk and now much more in Norfolk and Norwich. He currently holds the position of Executive Director of Development and City Services. So um, what Graham doesn't know about planning, honestly, it is not worth knowing. I'm going to say, Graham, welcome, thank you. Start, I've just forgotten, I've got to do the fire escape stuff, sorry about that. Um, it has to be done. Um, there was a fire, uh, there was, Tuesday is the fire alarm day, it's been done already this morning, if you hear a fire alarm, it is a real fire. Please exit out of the doors, <coughs> up the stairs, into the forum and out onto uh, St. Peter Mancroft Square, I think that's pretty much it. Anybody got any problems, uh, need help, then just shout and we'll get you out. Um, Alright, without further ado, Graham. Yeah. I'll give two apologies by way of starting. Firstly, is I haven't timed the presentation, so I have no idea how long this is going to take. I've heard Ian say he wants everybody out by one o'clock, so I'll be cognizant of that. And the second one, I'll start with a bit of an apology, is around when we agreed to do this, there are certain aspects that I thought I'd be able to be a bit more forthcoming about information when we spoke, um, as is not uncommon with some of the challenges you deal with when promoting strategic development like this. It's not all quite smoothly has gone to plan in quite the way I had hoped, when in the autumn we said February back end of might be a really good time to come and bang the drum for what is by far and away unbiased, the most exciting development opportunity this region has possibly ever seen. <coughs> that may be me over gilding it, but I am hugely enthused and excited about it and I hope you all will be similar. Similarly, sorry, um, View from above, this is what the site looks like at the moment. Um, we're not too far away from it, probably about 10 minutes walk where we are. We are all standing and this doesn't really tell the full story. It's effectively three large brownfield sites intersected by the River Wensum and the railway as you see. So they cluster together in that manner. You only really get a, a scale of the opportunity or an idea of why this is special if you look out. On my, on my kitchen wall at home, I'm a bit of a saddo, I've got a reverse map of Norwich, effectively, from LIDAR surveys, which actually gives you the intensity of the building densities across the city and how it works, and it's just a different way of visualising it. So instead of like this, where you see grey areas is all developed and then you get the roads, everything, you get a, a mapping system that speaks to you effectively about the density of land uses that are within it. Uh, I wasn't able to find a way of technically getting that image into this slide presentation. So, <laughs> established two things about me. Not only am I not on social media, I'm also technologically not very literate about it, or else I would have managed it. But had you seen it, you would have seen that city centre marked in red there stands out on that because clearly you're talking about a level of building density that is you know, really quite considerable and as you strip out into the suburbs you get very densely packed Victorian terraces etc lots of accommodation and life within a certain area. 
Then of course you go out to the wider area and you can see suburban development and most of the new development that's coming forward to meet the needs of Greater Norwich, particularly North East Grass Triangle coming forward, a lot of development down the A11 corridor, it's set out all in the strategic plans. You can see that because of the way the river works, the densities of the buildings stretch down the river and actually Norwich has this area of countryside, really impressive um, um, environment that people will want to be in, right <laughs> abruptly against a dense and hard end of the city. And it's that scale of opportunity that means that you've got the potential for something to absolutely change the way Norwich appears on the investment map with the new community, the new quarter that could be, could be set up there. Someone's tried to capture that in a way that I'm not doesn't sure it quite works as an idea, but you get that sense that you've got the broads immediately outside of the city with Whitlingham and the country park there, and you've got the potential to integrate the water with the land and particularly the heritage and come up with this amazing special place that not only um, delivers for the development that will come on it, but delivers for the rest of the city in terms of joining up connectivity around it and creates a new destination and a place for activity. This is some of the things we're trying to sell it on on the, on the left-hand side of the screen as you look at it. It's clearly the biggest regeneration site we've got in the region. It is one of the biggest ones on the go nationally at the moment. So colleagues from Homes England are significantly interested and we are showing the chief executive around the site uh, a week today. Uh, as I say, we hope it will be absolutely transformative, not just for the Brownfield <coughs> sites that are being redeveloped, but for the city itself and deliver ambition infrastructure that will link things together and yeah, deliver those things which are the context for the ambition bit at the bottom. A couple of images of the sites because the master plan that we went through the process of preparing um, uh, identified effectively three key themes and then a number of objectives. I'll run you through it uh, quite quickly but celebrating the waterfront, the amount of development land that presents to the river, giving you that opportunity for placemaking is quite remarkable. Um, it's quite quiet, I don't know if I'm, one of the things I do occasionally do is go out on canoes. It is a fascinating part of the city to go around on your canoe. That's the view further out towards the broads. Uh, you can see the deal ground on your right hand side, utility site on the left. Through the master plan proposals, the intention is to put certainly cycling and walking connectivity across the site so it doesn't just unlock the area for development but it connects beyond it creating you know easy sustainable uh, links through the site right into the broads effectively because one of the problems that we've got as a city we're not quite unique because since they made the south downs a national park Hampshire, uh, which is in Winchester, falls into the same category, but for decades we were the only city that had a national park run right into its heart of it, but you wouldn't know that if you were here, and actually the amount of boat traffic we get up the river is pitifully small, and we really do think we could get a much, much more active relationship with the broads, something around what used to be in the past, and that's the other main theme we've identified through the master plan process, about recognising the heritage value. It's quite interesting slide here with the former power station and a load of heritage that has been swept away when actually the point it's making is there's a massive and of standing heritage across the site <coughs> that we want to preserve and give a new lease of life to. But that does give you an impression of certainly back to the utility site, what the scale of the buildings uh, that were accommodated on that site back in the day were now once it's <coughs> cleared. That's an extract from the master plan, just dealing with um, those three primary opportunities in the way that architects, and I won't malign them, are very prone to do in terms of pretty pictures, because uh, I know we've got a few in the audience, so your valued colleagues, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, always have this uh, photoshop of all the lovely people always walking over with dogs and stuff like that. Uh, right. Uh, 
the master plan drills down into a, a, a subset of effectively uh, wider objectives because we're pushed for time I suspect I won't read through them uh, they're pretty they always write themselves when you're familiar with the site effectively but clearly there are issues around the quality of nature conservation on the site uh, especially in relation to the deal ground where there's an extensive county wildlife site flood marshes and clearly part of the idea and very precedent with everything going on about climate change and the propensity for more flood events coming on is how you manage and live with that flood risk in relation to major development. Uh, it's all set out within the detailed stuff behind the master plan, but it's eminently manageable. Nice palette of images across the site, giving the variety of you know deeply historic, you know, former former industrial eminently capable of conversion to some of the more heavy industries, particularly with the trace aggregate plants there and some of the wildlife uh, biodiversity areas across the site and the range of architectural styles that you've got. This is what the master plan tells us about sort of the capacity of the site, about what the theoretical capacity may be with 50 hectares of land split across essentially not that many owners. So in the great scheme of brownfield lands, the complexity of patterns of ownership isn't that great. And we worked to develop a relationship with each of the owners of the site. And indeed, over the past uh, couple of years, because of funding that we got through the Towns deal, we were able to become one of those landowners ourselves because we've purchased Carrow House and have uh, recently taken back um, receipts of the building following the works being done to stabilise Jeremiah Coleman's old house. So a fantastic orange tree on the side of it has recently been stabilised. So we're now proud owners of that site. If anybody's interested in letting it from us, have a conversation after. <laughs> uh, this is the master plan and this, this doesn't normally come over but this has got by far and away the best graphics facility of anywhere I know. So actually, you're probably at a scale where you can make out that. Again, we probably don't have the capacity to the time to go through this, but um, just things to highlight in terms of the master plan. Critical east-west corridor there, and across there you see a bridge. You'll also see a road and pedestrian bridge across there needed to unlock the site the utility site, certainly a route for a bridge across to Geoffrey Watling Way from the Carrow Works and to unlock it there you see a fourth bridge across connecting the May Gurney through to the Deal Ground site. Clearly we then have an issue with marina and creating a waterfront area uh, at the heart of the utility site as well. But across the site for it to work, the master plan identifies quite a lot of other opportunities for principally housing-led development but with a significant amount of commercial activity, preservation of the heritage, etc. One of the things about the site is that, um, uh, which is highlighted in the master plan effectively, is that because of the nature of it, it lends itself not to a homogeneity. It's a difficult word to bust out in a presentation like this, but you don't want a homogeneous form of development across the site. And that gives us a real opportunity and a real advantage in making all this happen. Because clearly you've got things that, in the, in the lie of the land, you've got this area here that already has seven, eight storey buildings on that you can wander around outside of the site and frankly you cannot see them. It's, um, there's other development on the other side of the river that easily accommodates that sort of scale of activity and it has a real dense and quite vibrant urban feel to it, even though there is nobody around. So that lends itself to effectively one sort of character area that hopefully you can extend beyond the barrier of the railway line at the moment and into the deal ground and the utility site in the north. But then you have an area of, um, we probably don't have some of the photos to quite illustrate that, <coughs> but the heritage value in that area around there with, with the Carrow Abbey, Carrow House, uh, multiple other listed, listed buildings and structures is just the most remarkable place to wander around. 
and will create an absolutely amazing living environment for anybody who values their environment to live in. The fact that you wander around and see the, the pet cemetery from the um, Coleman's family, so you can track their dogs' names from the 1850s <laughs> to the 1930s. The fact that you will see the war memorials for the staff who fell in the Great War, particularly the fact that you can come in there and see a U-shaped air raid shelter that the Commons built for their staff. Someone, someone, last person we showed in there, did ask the question of, well, when was this built then? We <laughs> said, rough guess, somewhere between 1939 and 1945. <laughs> no architectural historian. But it's fascinating when you go in there, because it's been shut since 1945. So you still, you walk in this air raid shelter, that has been closed for that time, and you see the stalls for the, uh, the old hospital wing of what used to be, you will see stretches that haven't been touched for the past 70 years and are frozen in times, and you will see the toilet cubicles were never plumbed in, but clearly, well, let's not go into the details, it is much time after all, but, you know, gents, ladies, lavatories, sign, all of the rest of that, for that subterranean environment for people to exist during the bombing raids. Fascinating bit of history dating, so you've got medieval right up to certainly post-war heritage of national importance, all telling a vital story, part of Norwich's existence. You cannot fail to get passionate about it when you see around there. And then I need to move on to moving on you clearly have large development areas in relation to the deal group. <coughs> it's effectively the Akis here from Sirius. Uh, it's cleared. It's classic brownfield site, no development on it. One bottle kiln. I shouldn't be dismissive of it, but when you look at the heritage value uh, over the rest of the site, that one bottle kiln isn't, isn't the most important asset, uh, effectively. But clearly, um, you've, got, you've got the wildlife site, effectively, the county wildlife <coughs> site. That, water meadow that exists there and getting that restored and getting that sense of the countryside bleeding into the city gives you a real opportunity for a very different style of development in that in that area particularly and then you come up to what they're describing waterside north the far side of the utilities site which is a heavily constrained site and will probably be the last part of the site to be developed because of the heavy infrastructure costs of accessing it via that road and those two bridges, but that, again, with its very lengthy waterfront, has a real potential to create a new, different and very special place for people to live. Uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say there are some challenges too, and that is probably uh, an, an under, understatement of the thing. Clearly, getting the funding for the infrastructure and finding an equitable way of delivering that coupled with uh, what you all must be ever so cognizant of about the growing viability challenge for any form of development <coughs> at the moment. Uh, that that £150 million, three million pound gap figure came out of the stage two of the master plan process and so was produced effectively last May or June. We haven't had the wherewithal to produce that figure again, and I'm quite grateful of it. And clearly, with the intervening build cost inflation, we've had cost of longer term money and risk aversion on behalf of the market. Uh, uh, that, that 153, a gap to deliver the entirety of the scheme as you'd assess it now, may well be something of an underestimate. Uh, we've got ongoing issues about the rights and navigation. Clearly, the illustration there is of Trouse Rail Bridge. That bridge uh, is the only part of the electrified main rail network in the country that actually opens. Uh, it does so only very, very sporadically. Uh, and that's part of the issues that we've got in terms of boat access to the city. There's a right of navigation. We need to navigate this, if you pardon the pun, in terms of taking it forward but where the city council particularly is coming from is because of the constraint by that bridge, which effectively has only opened once in the past decade, to let uh, high, high vessels into the river, the cost of respecting that right of navigation 
is going to have a massive impact on whether this development that I'm talking about is deliverable anyway. And frankly, I don't think I will stand a cat in hell's chance of getting anybody to fund further opening bridges over that river if I can say the chances are they'll only be used once in a decade to open, <laughs> to let those high vessels in. Uh, as this whole development is going to need public subsidy, I can't see, I couldn't have seen, even in the more generous times, uh, you sort of cat and hell's chance of getting that funding secured. So that's a real challenge for us, one that we're having ongoing conversations, particularly with the Broad Authority, about, because perhaps I should have said, this is a complex bureaucracy and administrative area. You have uh, probably a good example. That is in the area of Broadland District Council. Uh, this is the city. Uh, that bit is South Norfolk. <laughs> so just within this tiny fraction of the site, you have three different local councils and three different planning authorities for that area. So and in that case, one of the planning authorities isn't one of the councils because you've got the Broads Authority with the navigation right and the planning responsibilities that overfly it. So part of the idea that we're doing is to try and get everybody behind uh, the, the master plan and build that consensus around what it says, but it will take some time to get there. Um, just some of the other issues I wanted to highlight in terms of the challenges, obviously, We've got an issue about longer term stewardship. Um, we've got the Abbey ruins and that you know, grade one listed house amongst many other heritage assets. Clearly that has an impact to how the development may be brought forward because we would be failing in our duty if we didn't have a system whereby you could be sure that they were going to be preserved in the longer term. Um, doesn't necessarily suit all development models and as I want, you were never going to get out of here without somebody mentioning nutrient neutrality. <laughs> I know you're all struggling with it, it makes no sense from several angles including those from the local authorities but we are where we are with it, we're working through it, we're trying to identify the solution. I won't go into the details now but you'll be aware various papers are going through councils to identify joint ventures to try and unlock what will be the solution to a quite a complex problem that's probably been artificially, well not artificially created, there's another way of saying it, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a real problem, but what, what the solution may deliver won't crack the problem, in my view, which is the fundamental problem. If you were going to do something as far-reaching and as harmful as being done, you ought to do it for the idea that the water quality in the area are going to be substantially improved, not just the harm by new development mitigated. Anyway, I won't go on because that's not the point I was making. The point I was making about the challenge we have is that's an additional cost going through. Developments like this, very difficult to see how they're ever going to do anything to, to, to manage the issue of nutrient neutrality on site. So it requires that wider sub-regional approach to effectively identify where those mitigation measures are going to be, that comes at a substantial cost and obviously also has an impact on cash flow, particularly for any development. So it's a major issue that we still need to bottom out. This is the same, same master plan effectively with a bit more infrastructure detail in it. Points I was going to make is we are acutely aware that to make all this stack up and particularly to unlock the development on the utility site and the deal ground, which have been, in some cases, consented for many years, in some cases, just postulated for other forms of development, but there you go. Um, to deliver this vision that's there, you're going to need some aspect of public subsidy to it. Uh, there'll be certain possibilities, you know, Section 106, Community Infrastructure Levy, the devolution deal, we're still exploring, we won't know for some time. County Council is still clearly involved in the delivery board we've set up, so that, that, that delivers possible sources of funding. But actually, what we're going to need to do is two things. Unlock national funding sources, available principally through Homes England, 
uh, for it, but also ensure we've we've always steered away steered away from the term of sort of uh, equalisation across the site because the sites have very different characteristics and from my angle very different values associated with each part of it, but certainly. There is a real axe to debt in terms of equitable delivery of how which bits of infrastructure need to be contributed by which development and how the public funding gets applied to it. Uh, I'll skip over this because I know we are running out of time. I have bored you too long with tales of my childhood. But these are the sch schedules of the level of development that might actually be delivered. The thing you might want to take from that slide is whilst this is undoubtedly residential led, to really make this work, we're going to need a commercial heart to the development, and finding that and delivering that is going to be one of the key challenges. This is where we are, uh, taken from a drone photo from us when we were trying to pull together the marketing material for Carrow House, which is there. You do get that impression of just how, how, how green and verdant the site is, and then how the uh, dense urban area immediately ceases when it comes into contact with the broads area and so what that scale of possibility is there. So last things that formerly were in the public domain is uh, June last year City Council approved the overall master plan. Uh, we are tied up in the process around the Greater Norwich local plan where there's a policy in it. Uh, we are uh, going to work through uh, and give that master plan formal status through an SPD as soon as we can when we have a policy for it to supplement that is going to be early next year the sessions about the East Norwich session I thought went really well uh, the examination took place uh, effectively last year and you will note that whilst I don't know if you're reading from the professional planning press many areas have used the uncertainty created by the revised MPPF etc to delay progress on their local plans. Collectively the Greater Norwich authorities haven't and are still fighting the good fight to try and get that certainty in place of having an adopted up to date local plan. We hopefully will achieve that milestone in early next year and at that point certainly hope that the issue of uh, nutrient neutrality and how we can then move to implementation will be well and truly sorted, albeit that might come at a cost. The other thing, and this is what I referred to at the start, we had hoped uh, to have completed the delivery study that we're doing jointly with Homes England at the moment. The purpose of that was to take forward the master plan, produce a more detailed and granular approach to establishing the viability to inform decisions about the equitable apportionment of some of the costs and potentially identify what, if any, form of delivery vehicle is needed. I think. Uh, from my point of view, the bit I'll say is I think that some form of delivery of aircon needed part to ensure that any the infrastructure money, the grant funding, the subsidy that will need to be applied can be applied through an appropriate <coughs> body that is capable of taking that money, entering deals with landowners, potentially owning and developing sites itself. But it'll need some relatively powerful overseeing body to actually apply the money. The nature of that will be the outcome there. I had hoped to go into further details, but that's still work in progress. And alongside all of this, we will keep on talking to whoever wishes to engage with us, or frankly, anybody who we can bore rigid about the scale of opportunity, because I really want their money, or about people who might have particular legitimate interests about how it may affect them either beneficially or adversely. So we've got lists of stakeholders, we will periodically engage with them to give regular updates. So if you're still around in a few years' time, I might come back and give you another one if you want. Uh, in terms of timelines, this is a bit high level. Uh, I had hoped to be out on consultation in relation to a major planning application at the moment. As things stand, before applications get validated and driven forward, that's likely to be this this spring, particularly from Carrow Works, we then have reserve matters issues for some of the consents in relation to the deal ground and the May Gurney site that may follow on shortly after that. So that will plough one on one level. 
the next phase of the master planning process will be effectively taking us into business ca case preparation, funding bids, discussions with the development, various funding partners about how we can access that money. There's a there's a um, you know risk factors around whether that will be successful. Undoubtedly, and we're into um, by the start of next year, we ought to be into hopefully adoption of the development plan effectively and the supplementary planning guidance coming on, cut a long story short, by early 2025 we see a real potential for actually development to start coming out of the, uh, the ground on the site. This is, how, as always, when you're building the viability model you need to work out phasings. These were some of the indicative phasings in the master plan just to give you more than anything a sort of impression of the level of detail the work has gone into as you can see it's not going to be delivered overnight if we can get it finished by 2037 I think we'll chalk that up as a win although I'm unlikely to be around certainly in an employment sense to celebrate that though I'd hope to be down there possibly uh, drinking something on the, when it gets completed come back and see it in my dotage um, uh, but as always, the timing of how this phases out is going to be critically delivered by two things. One, strength and confidence in the market. Secondly, is how we actually <coughs> succeed in coordinating that infrastructure investment to unlock it. Because clearly the market is going to have far more confidence on the ability to deliver it with some public sector backing about the de uncertainty about the delivery of the key bits of infrastructure to get in there. Governance is a bit of a buzzword in my world at the moment. We clearly have moved slightly in terms of how we're overseeing this project. We had a wider partnership set up some time ago. That's overseen work on the preparation of the master plan, which is now largely complete in terms of the vision. We're now moving into delivery mode. We still have all the relevant public sector bodies working with us and involved in that delivery board. That's what we've been doing over the autumn is working with partners effectively because we are in the business of bidding for and seeking funds and trying to apply them. That's necessarily more of a private, more of a public sector activity to get that case for that subsidy built, which is at the moment why the detailed delivery board doesn't have any of the landowners involved in the site. But we keep maintaining that wider engagement with the landowners so if anything I've said has come as a surprise to Akis, I will be a bit disappointed. Uh, and clearly alongside this we just need to bang the drum so all the industry is aware of the potential scale of the opportunity and what is coming down the track. And all the key stakeholders that are going to put into the detail of this process are aware of what is coming. Uh, I'm nearly there. penultimate slide. Some just key things, needs, opportunities, uh, commercial development without an economic soul to this particular development which we're having some discussions that are quite interested but people have got particularly institutional uses in mind could easily be accommodated on site. This is always going to take longer to be delivered. It needs a sort of economic rationale Without it, it's going to take the absorption rates, the state of the market, it's going to take an awful long time to deliver. Whether or not you get that commercial heart to it, uh, there's an opportunity for forms of residential development uh, that we haven't seen in the city at any particular scale. Most noticeably built to rent properties because of its location and where you are in the city. Uh, there's also opportunities that we're still exploring in relation to how we're going to deal with some of the um, sustainability issues, particularly around power. Uh, there's quite a lot of interesting, clearly we've got the advantage of being having the mains grid connection right as part of the site into it, but there's also a whole litany of fascinating underground infrastructure facilities, particularly across the Caro Works site. Then we've got the marinas and we've got the social infrastructure that all needs to come forward uh, and we're trying to align all that at the moment. And this is what I just wanted to finish on, where we are as we sit here on the cusp of 
March. Uh, hopefully, in one or two months' time, the delivery study recommendation will be out there and we'll be able to take that forward in terms of decisions about setting up whatever vehicles may be needed. We hope for, in again, a couple of months' time, potentially we'll be out on consultation in relation to the application for Caro Works that is in, and we are working on resolving some of the details about that in terms of supporting documents before it's consulted. Reserve matters for uh, <coughs> Megurnian deal grounds, so needless to say, it already has consent, although it's very long, long in the tooth, are anticipated in summer 2023. <coughs> and the next things that we're doing technically, working particularly with Network Rail, County Council, and Ports Authority on bridges issues and pulling together uh, business cases to get lots of money out of governments, hopefully, and others who may be interested. That's where we are. If I hit that, it'll go blank. It will come back, but that's the last slide. Then thank you very much, Graham. I, mean, I don't envy you. I, I, I think your challenges and uh, uh, with this site um, are immense, and uh, for someone who has to get up every morning and go to work, and uh, open the file again on the uh, East and Orange regeneration. Um, uh, you've certainly got some stamina, that's for sure. Um, I look forward to seeing you on your canoe uh, on the uh, Wensum when it's all complete, and um, we'll join you for a glass of whatever you choose to take. Um, but thank you very much, Graham. It was a great talk. And uh, are you okay if we? Uh, I've got a copy of the presentation. Is it? Is it okay if anybody else wants it? Um, Slides sending over? Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be sacked if there's anything in it that's confidential. Yeah. I think everything that I've said today might not be widely known, but I think everything okay. is in it is effectively <coughs> available via our website one yeah. way or another, or has otherwise been said in public. Before. So, if anybody would like a copy of the slides, um, exactly. contact Julie, uh, Secretary at FCI, and we'll get a copy over to you. So, anyway, but thank you very much, Graham. Excellent. Thank you. All I'll say is um, we look forward to seeing any of you can make it to the Digitech uh, building on City College on the 22nd of March. Okay? Thank you.